Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Folks, there's no secret, no magic trick to learning a language. The easy way is the hard way. You learn by doing, you learn by practicing, you learn by throwing yourself into it. Nothing I'm going to tell you is going to contradict that. But with the years of experience I have teaching Old Norse, I can give you, I can point out where some of the rocks are and help you step over them in the smartest way possible. That being said, let's get into a little bit of grammar with the Old Norse class, part two. One of the things you really have to think about with Old Norse, as with many other Indo-European languages, is case. What are nouns and things that act like nouns, pronouns, I, you, he, or the adjectives that modify them, big, small, little, blue, red? How, what role are those playing in a sentence? Now in English, we're not completely unfamiliar with this. In English, you know there's something wrong if I say something like me am in Colorado. You know that it's supposed to be I am in Colorado, even if you've never formally studied English. Whereas if I say he shot I, you know there's something wrong with that too. It ought to be he shot me. But what's actually different between I and me? Both when I am talking refer to me. The difference is that I is a subject of a verb, me is the object. Now, Old Norse says the exact same thing, but it's not just with common pronouns like I, me, he, him. It actually runs through the entire system. So that for instance, a man may, name, may be named Sigurdur, but that's just his name if he's the subject of a sentence. Sigurdur slow or Sigurdur struck a serpent. But if that serpent struck him, Ormer, slow Sigurd, you knock that R off because he is the object. Now, if only it were so simple that every noun just had an R that you knocked off, but that's mostly the rule for masculine nouns and now and then a feminine noun. And that is another issue with Old Norse, that you have masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. Now, a lot of people are familiar with masculine and feminine because, of course, Spanish and French have masculine uh, and feminine, right? El sol, la luna. And the genders, like in Spanish or French, are fundamentally random in Old Norse. So that, for instance, uh, behind me, you have a tree, tre, which is neuter. Here's my hand, hond, which is feminine. And on my hand is a ring, Ringer, which is masculine. Arbitrary. So you do have to learn what nouns are what gender, but much like how in Spanish you might learn that nouns that end in O are typically masculine, nouns that end in A are typically feminine, there's some things you can watch for in knowing uh, what gender Old Norse words are. But what is this case business about? Old Norse has nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative cases. That's just for, for those of you who may have encountered languages like Sanskrit or Russian with a lot more. Nominative means the subject case. So I is the nominative form of, of the pronoun I, he, she, they. These are nominatives, right? So if someone is running, someone is jumping, someone is, that is the nominative form of the noun and pronoun you're going to use there. That is also the one you're most likely to see because just about any sentence has a stated subject. So if in doubt, and there's just one noun, it's probably nominative. If there's two nouns, probably one is nominative, and there's a good chance another one is accusative. Accusative is the case of the direct object. So I see, I is nominative. What do I see? I see a tree, tree is accusative. I hit, I is the subject nominative. Who do I hit? I hit Travis, and so Travis is accusative. 
I'm using examples with pronouns for the subject, but you can also, of course, just use nouns. Sigurder uh, is fighting a dragon. Sigurder is the subject, dragon, the object, is accusative. Then, probably third most likely you're going to see, is genitive. Now, genitive we're actually fairly used to in English. Genitive is the form for possession. So, in English, when you add apostrophe s to a noun, that is its genitive form. And in fact, that comes from the genitive form in Old English, at least for masculine and neuter nouns. So, Jackson's truck, Jackson's is genitive. Travis's car, Travis is genitive. Colorado's natural wonders, Colorado is genitive. Now, there will still be a subject, and the thing that is possessed is not genitive. This is a common mistake beginners can make. If I say Colorado's natural wonders stun visitors, what are the cases there? Pause this if you want to think about it for a minute. The cases are Colorado's genitive, natural wonders nominative, because it's the natural wonders that are doing the stunning, and then visitors are accusative. So notice you can always take the genitive out and still have a meaningful sentence. The natural wonders stun visitors. But Colorado's natural wonders, Colorado's is genitive. Old Norse adds an extra wrinkle here because the very common preposition till, which means to, also takes a genitive. If I go to a mountain, I go til fjels, which is the genitive form, right? It adds that S just like in English. This would be similar to um, if I said I am running to them in English, if I said, said I am running to their, T-H-E-I-R. So that's a little wrinkle you'll find out pretty, pretty fast. Now, the least likely case you'll see, perhaps, although you're going to see it all the time, is dative. A dative is the case of the indirect object. Most sentences are complete without a dative. So, I gave a book. I gave away a book. I is the subject. Book is the accusative. But I gave Luke a book. Luke is the dative. Right? Because the, what am I giving that's what the accusative will always answer, right? Accusative always answers the what is being verbed question. Book is accusative. But to who, I refuse to say whom, even though it's the old dative in English because nobody says it anymore and it's an artificial word now. To who did I give it? I gave it to Luke. Luke is dative. Give me the sword. Me is dative because you're giving what? You're giving the sword, but you're giving it to who? You're giving it to me, so me is dative. So I will always write cases of nouns in that order. Nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. You'll sometimes see it in a different order. For example, uh, there's a fair number of people who will write it nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. I like the nominative, accusative, genitive, dative order because most older works on Germanic linguistics, uh, the linguistics of languages like Old English, Old Norse, Old High German, Gothic, use that order, and because it also has that rough correspondence to the frequency with which you'll see those cases. Look for nominative first, accusative second, then look for your genitives and datives, typically. There's going to be wrinkles in all of this. All right, so what does this look like in practice? If I have a masculine word, now we're coming back to the gender question. I'm going to look it up in the dictionary, and a solid eight, eight and a half times out of ten, I'm going to see a noun that ends in R. So fire. Let's do elements. Very common words in Old Norse. Fire is elder. I look it up in the dictionary, say the Cleesby Vigerson dictionary, easily available online, very comprehensive. I'm going to say elder. But that's its nominative form. The fire burned my house, I would say elder. But what if I started a fire? Well, then it's accusative, right? Because what did I start? I started a fire. Then it's eld. I'm knocking that R off. Elder, accusative eld. What if it's the fire's flames? Scorched the trees. Then it's genitive, right? The fire's flames. Fire's genitive is elts. Notice genitive s in most masculine and neuter nouns in Old Norse. Very similar to the genitive apostrophe s in English, but notice it's not written with an apostrophe s in Old Norse or in the modern Scandinavian languages, which maintain the genitive s. All of them do. And the dative, eldi. I gave the fire the remnants of my old life. <laughs> I don't know. 
What did I give? I gave the remnants of my old life. What did I give it to? I gave it to the fire. Elder, eld, else, eldi. Now if I show you another common noun, say another element, wind, it's vinder, it's going to fall into that same pattern. Vinder, vind, vince, vindi. Most, not all, but if you just count them all out, most masculine nouns will fall into that pattern. But that's just the singular, there's also the plural. What if multiple fires have raged this landscape? That's nominative plural, that's eldar. What if I started multiple fires? Uh, this is not an admission of arson. Well, that's elda. That's accusative plural. Genitive plural, elda. The multiple fires flames burn the town. Elda. I gave to the fires my gifts. I don't know. That's eldum. That's the dative plural. Now notice, in Old Norse, if you give something to something, you don't ever use the word to, you just use the dative. So you just say, ek gav eldum javir. I don't know, I gave fires gifts. You don't say the word to. That word to that takes the genitive is only for direction. I went to a mountain, right? It's not for giving to. Give to is always expressed by the dative. All right, common masculine nouns, and this is gonna be part of your vocabulary assignment for this particular lesson. We just saw two good, solid element words, elder, fire, vinder, wind. Also learn heimer, home, or world, inhabitation, place of dwelling. Home is the solid, basic translation for that. Now, notice, EI in Old Norse is A sound, not an I sound like in German. And almost any time you see an EI in Old Norse, it's going to correspond to an O sound in English. So heim, home, stain, stone. This is a pretty solid rule that you can keep in mind. The languages are close enough related that you can sometimes find these exact correspondences like that. Learn also, since we're going to be reading mythological texts, a word you're going to see fairly often, dwerger, dwarf, dwerger, garther, enclosure, fence, or place enclosed by a fence. Hester, horse. Ulver, wolf. All right. Now let's talk about neuter nouns after a quick message from my sponsor. Neuter nouns look basically like masculine nouns, although they don't end in that R in the nominative. Let's take another element as our example. Vat, water. Nominative, vatn, water flows. Accusative, vatn, so they're the same. Vatn, vatn, I see water, vatn. Genitive and dative will be the same as masculine. Add S for genitive, add I for dative. Vatns, vatni. So the water's shores, that's genitive. I gave the water my gift. <laughs> it's terrible, these examples. That would be vatni. Plural, here's where we're going to throw a wrinkle in. Vatn. And then that's the nominative and accusative plural. Vatn. We have changed the vowel, not added an ending. Now, only the letter A and only the short letter A will change into that hook O vowel. Whenever you see hook O, O cow data, it is always a mutated earlier A. And there, what it's caused by is it used to be, and Old Norse still has this rule in effect that a lot of the conditions for it have disappeared, a U in an unstressed syllable changes the A in the syllable before it into a hook O. So it once was that the plural nominative and accusative ending for the neuter actually ended in U. The U has disappeared, but the way that it's changed the vowel, A uh, and the O, has remained. So, vatn, vatn, water, waters. Then, for the genitive plural, you and the dative plural, exactly the same as masculine, it's actually the same in masculine, neuter and feminine. Vatna, 
So waters, the waters, edges, genitive plural. And then for dative plural, what num, because you always have to remember if you've got a U that comes after an A, that U is going to change the A to a hook O. And I'll warn you about places where U's have disappeared that have caused that change nevertheless. So take any Old Norse neuter noun that doesn't end in a vowel. We'll come back to that kind of thing later. And it will go the same way. Take, for instance, ocean, hav. Same pattern. Hav, hav, hafs, havi, hov, vowel change, hov, hava. Vowel changes back because there's no u behind it, there's an a behind it. Hovu. All right, so your neuter words to learn are vaten, it's water, hav, it's ocean, god, that's god. Now, in a word like god, where it's not, there's no vowel a, that vowel isn't going to change. The plural of god is goth. This pattern goes goth, goth, goths, gothi, goth, goth, gotha, goldum. There's no separate plural. The plural is the same as a singular because there's no a to change into the hoko. Learn mol, which is speech or business. Learn hoos, which is house, skip, which is ship, and lead, which is a group of men, often an army. Now let's talk about feminines. Feminines in the singular have the U mutation, or what we call U umlaut in Old Norse. U umlaut doesn't mean U with two dots above it. It means the process of U umlauting or mutating the vowel in front of it. So in the nominative singular, a feminine noun, such as, let's do an element again, jorth, earth, already has a mutated vowel. Feminines are pretty easy, but they're different from masculines and feminines. For the nominative, we have yorth, the earth is beautiful. The accusative is yorth, I see the earth. The genitive is yardar. So there you see the actual underlying basic vowel of this word is a, ah, mutated into hooko by u's that used to be in the nominative and accusative but aren't anymore. But it comes back in the genitive singular because the ending ar doesn't have a u in it, so it changes back into the, its actual basic vowel a. Ah. So yardar. Thor is sometimes called Yardar Sonar, son of earth, because one of his mother's names is Yorth Earth. And then dative, often simply Yorth, although you will sometimes in archaic texts, and the mythic texts certainly can be, see a dative where the U is still present. You'll never see the U remain in the nominative or accusative, but you will see it sometimes in the dative. So you might see someone stands all Yorthu on the earth. Many prepositions also take a dative object. We'll get to that later too. And then plural, yardir, yardir. So again, we got ear. It's got an I, not a U. So the vowel reverts back to its basic form, A. So that would be like the earths, the multiple earths, or the multiple soils, something like that. Or I saw the multiple earths. Yardir, yardir, nominative and accusative. And then typically, as always, genitive plural ends in A, dative plural ends in um. Yartha, yordum. Again, U changes that A back into hooko. Always be ready for you to do that. Always happen. Learn these feminine words. Jorth, verld, which means world. Old, which means age, like a period of time. At, which means family, or direction, by the way, but they're unrelated words, both good to learn. And borg, which is essentially an elevated place that can be elevated by humans, so it can be like a fort, or it can be something lower than a mountain, it's like a hill. Mountain, by the way, tack this on there. Mountain is a neuter word, it's fjall. And they talk about mountains enough that it's worth putting, putting on there for sure. If you're dealing with a feminine word that doesn't have that hook O vowel, like at, uh, then there's no vowel change. The pattern goes at, at, atar, at, archaically atu, atir, atir, atta, atum. It's only a to hook o that changes when you have those u's or those now disappeared u's. Now, from this, you can usually guess, although it's not foolproof, no one would fault you for assuming this, that a noun that ends in r, when you look it up in the dictionary, and it's, which the dictionary will always give you the nominative form of the word, a noun that ends in r is going to be masculine. And then among nouns that don't end in r, if they still end in a consonant, not a vowel, and we'll get to the ones that are in vowels later, 
if the vowel is hook o, then it's going to be feminine because they have that u used to be in the singular nominative, so it's mutated all the old ahs and hook o's. But if it's a, like an hav, then you know it's neuter because if it were feminine, it would have been mutated into hov in the singular. Whereas in neuters, that's the plural, hov. If it seems a little bit complicated, it really isn't. Just watch for the fact that nouns that end in an r assume they're masculine. If they don't end in an r, but they still end in a consonant, assume they're feminine if they end in o, or if they have the hook o vowel in them. Assume they're neuter if they have the vowel a in them, letter a. And otherwise, something like borg, a skip, you just have to you just have to know it. Although there's that's not that complicated to figure out over time. If you read a lot of Old Norse, you will eventually uh, internalize the genders of, of particularly common words. And what I'm giving you are always in the top 100, 150 commonest words, especially in our mythical texts. All right, I'm going to put some, uh, some vocabulary items that were not on that list on the screen. And you can practice uh, figuring out what gender they are and then figuring out what all their different forms are. And uh, if you are on Patreon, feel free to send me your answers to that, and I'll look them over and let you know how you're doing. For now, I will wish you all the best from the most beautiful place in the world, the San Juan Mountains, Southwest Colorado. All the best, folks. Now let me make a quick PSA here. Um, I know many people are, and, and I'm flattered that many people are interested in coming to the University of Colorado to study with me or, or take my classes. But remember, as discussed in several videos, I am leaving the Nordic program at the end of spring 2020. So I will no longer be teaching classes like Norse mythology, Icelandic sagas at CU. If those classes continue to be taught at CU, they'll be taught by somebody else. I will no longer have any association with the Nordic program. I will still be at the University of Colorado in an unpaid position as resident scholar. And hopefully uh, during this period, I'll have more time to uh, make these videos, which of course reach more people than any classroom ever will, um, work on my upcoming translations such as the Prose Edda and work on my class in Norse mythology for the great courses. But please don't come here thinking, um, that, that I run some, some Hogwarts for Old Norse, I, that I, I don't, and you're not gonna find that anywhere, actually. There really aren't any good jobs teaching this stuff, and I need to try to make a living. Um, and actually, given the lack of rewards in teaching this stuff in a conventional way in classrooms, I, I need to take the time away from the classroom to work on these projects that really reach the people that are interested in this stuff, the videos, the books, and now great courses. All right. Well, as always, for beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best and uh, good health and the best to you and yours during this uh, whole coronavirus situation in April 2020. All the best.